Hello everybody, Terreno here, and today we are going to take a look at Swiss tanks I would like to see added to War Thunder. This will be a two-part series, with this first episode focused on Swiss tanks of the World War II period, an era where Switzerland was surrounded by Axis powers, and thus, despite having no experience in designing or producing tanks, had to rely almost exclusively on domestically produced tanks leading us to some rather interesting designs. Now before we look at the tanks themselves, we have to answer the question of how should Switzerland be added. Personally, I think it would be best to add them to the French tech tree, because the only two tech trees they really fit with are Germany and France, and Germany doesn't really need the extra vehicles, while France does have quite a few tech tree gaps that could be filled. I would also personally like to see them added as a subtree, but I suspect Gaijin may end up adding them individually, as and when they are needed. Which is not ideal, but it is better than nothing. So with that out of the way, let's look at some Swiss tanks. Now Switzerland had brought a number of tanks in the interwar period, these being two French FT-17s and four British Vickers commercial light tanks as well as assessing other tanks like the Swedish Landsverk L60. But for the most part, Switzerland just didn't have many tanks, due to its neutrality, mountainous terrain, and the general peacefulness of Europe during the interwar period. However, as storm clouds gathered over Europe in the build-up to World War II, Switzerland started to modernise its armed forces, and this included acquiring tanks, first by purchasing them from other nations, and ultimately with the aim of building up its ability to produce tanks domestically. In 1937, the Swiss were looking to buy a new tank, and opted to buy it from Czechoslovakia, who at this point were willing to sell them, something they might not have been willing to do a year later, when the Munich crisis kicked off. While the first tanks that they offered didn't fit Swiss requirements, the Swiss were finally offered the LTL tank, which was a derivative of the TNH, and this ultimately fit most of their needs. However, the Swiss did ask for some changes, noticeably to the armament and the engine, and it was agreed that the tanks themselves would be assembled in Switzerland using Czech-built parts under the designation Panzer 39, thus allowing Switzerland to gain experience in producing tanks domestically. Unfortunately, only 24 tanks were able to be constructed before Czechoslovakia was occupied by Germany, cutting off access to the necessary parts. Looking at the armament first, the original 20mm Orlikon cannon has been swapped for a rather unique 24mm Panzerwagen Kanona 1938, which may later have been upgraded to a Tankbusker 41, both of which were anti-tank rifles. Penetration figures for these guns do seem to be a bit all over the place, though Ian McCullum over at Forgotten Weapons gives a figure for the Tank Busker 41 of about 36mm at 500m, which would make this a rather powerful weapon. However, being anti-tank rifles, these weapons used 6 round box magazines, meaning that despite having a fairly fast semi-automatic firing rate, they were limited by their need to reload often. In addition to the main armament, there was also three 7.5mm machine guns, two of which were the Panzerwagen Machine Gewehr 1938 and one Leichter's Machine Gewehr 1925. The Model 1938 weapons were mounted in the bow machine gun position and in the commander's position, which was to the right of the main gun, while the Model 1925 gun was mounted in a coaxial position to the left of the gun. Now I'm unsure who actually was supposed to man the bow machine gun, because there wasn't actually a crewman assigned to this position. Presumably it was supposed to be the driver, perhaps when the vehicle was stopped, or maybe a crewman was supposed to climb down from the turret to man it, but this is just speculation on my part. The armour was decent for this vehicle, with a maximum frontal thickness of 32mm, with the sides being 15mm and 8mm for the rear. Not great if the Panzer 39 is flanked, but not terrible if taking shots from the front, especially against low calibre rounds. Mobility was pretty good with a top speed of 45km an hour or 28mph, 
which made this a pretty speedy tank, while the crew complement was free, consisting of a driver in the hull and the gunner and commander in the turret. It should also be mentioned that the 12 initial Panzer 39s had Czech built petrol engines, while the latter 12 had Sauer diesel engines, though both vehicles had the same top speed and power to weight ratio. Personally, I would suggest adding the diesel powered variant first, with the petrol variant being folded or added as a premium tank. It should also be mentioned that there were attempts to upgun the Panzer 39 to a 47mm gun, but this wasn't actually tested until 1945, by which point the gun was thoroughly obsolete, and as far as I'm aware, it never actually went beyond one prototype, which was tested with a wooden mock up gun. Though if the prototype with an actual 47mm gun was added, it could be a decent tier 1 premium tank. As for the original Panzer 39, if it was added to War Thunder, I could see it being a decent reserve tank for Switzerland, as it seems like it would play like a worse Panzer 38T, though still able to do decent enough damage against unsuspecting foes, and I think this would be a great place to start off a Swiss subtree or even to introduce as a standalone tank. By 1940, World War II had broken out and war was raging over Europe, leaving Switzerland in a bit of a pickle. While of course it was hoping to avoid being conquered like its neighbour France, and it did its best not to provoke an invasion, it still needed effective weapons in the event of one. The feared invasion never came, but the Germans did plan one under Operation Tannenbaum, so it was a well-founded fear. Unfortunately, being surrounded on all sides by Axis nations, i.e. the very nations it would be defending itself against in the event of an invasion, this left Switzerland with rather limited options in what weapons it could acquire from abroad, though it did manage to obtain 12 or so Renault R35s from French troops fleeing the fall of France. All in all, this would have left Switzerland's total armoured force to face any invasion, numbering at 24 Panzer 39s and 12 R35s and a handful of other obsolete vehicles, which was hardly a match for the Wehrmacht. So Switzerland was forced to produce the weapons it needed domestically, leading us to our first Swiss-designed vehicle, the homegrown Swiss tank destroyer the Kampf Kanona 1, which I will now refer to as the NK-1, though in English it translates to melee cannon. Built in a lengthened Panzer 39 chassis, this vehicle rather resembles some German designs, like the Marder tank destroyers, though I personally think the actual fighting compartment itself mostly resembles the Japanese Honey 3. It also fixes many of the problems that similar German vehicles suffered from, namely an exposed fighting compartment though the armour itself is likely only capable of protecting against shrapnel and smaller calibre weapons, with the sides and rear armour maxing out at 25mm, though this is for the hull itself and I believe the actual fighting compartment is even thinner than this. Armour for the rest of the vehicle is a little bit better, with the front having a maximum thickness of 40mm, which is not great but also not too shabby either. The main armament of the NK-1 was a Swiss built gun, the 75mm Lent 49 Pac 44, which was based off of the Swiss built 75mm Flab Can 38 anti aircraft gun, which was in turn a licensed produced variant of the French Canon de 75CA Model 1940 Schneider. Unsurprisingly, considering this was a relatively obscure weapon used by a neutral country that never actually had to use it in combat. There isn't an awful lot of information on this weapon, at least in the English speaking world. I've seen some speculation that the armour penetration would be similar to the Pac 39 Lent 48, which has a penetration of 130mm at 500m with APC BC shells. Now, at first, I thought this might be a little optimistic, as the Pac 39's shell has a velocity of 770m a second, while the Schneider AA guns have a muzzle velocity in the low 700s, which is more comparable to the KW K 42's 740m a second with its APC BC shells. However, even with a slightly lower velocity, this would still give the NK 1 a penetration of a little less than 123mm at 500 meters with comparable ammo. So only about 10 millimeters or so worse penetration at 500 meters than the Pac-39, which is still a pretty good performance. 
Being built on the Panzer 39 chassis, it still retains its top speed of 45 km an hour or 28 miles per hour. Though due to the extra weight, it will have a tougher time reaching this while its off-road mobility will also be affected. Lastly, the crew complement was 5, which I've seen listed as a driver, gunner, commander and two loaders. Though some sources state that this was actually two gunners and a loader. Though in game it would obviously be the former crew complement and I'm not really sure why you would need two gunners for a single gun vehicle. Now going on a slight detour it should be mentioned that while testing the NK1 it was decided to test it with a 105mm howitzer. More specifically the 10.5cm HB Model 42 which was a Swiss produced variant of the Swedish Bofors 10.5cm Halbitz M40. However, it seems this involved a little more than just swapping out the gun, as the fighting compartment itself is now open-topped, obviously making it a much easier target for enemies, though little else is changed on the vehicle, and obviously it was at some point changed back, or perhaps they used a second vehicle for the actual testing. Now for the howitzer itself, it does seem that it had some sort of anti-tank round available to it, but I've not been able to find any information on it. Finnish variants of the gun were equipped with heat shells, so the Swiss version may also have this, but even without these shells, I suspect its high explosive shells would have a similar penetration to other 105mm howitzers, so like the M4A3105, it would probably have about 27mm of penetration. Meaning it could stand against lower tier tanks if only using HE, though the anti-tank shell would likely allow it to take on tougher enemies. In the end, the NK1 project didn't progress beyond the one prototype, with work instead moving on to its more advanced successor, the NK2. While the NK1 would go on to be placed as a display at the Panzer Museum Tun. But where would the NK1 go in War Thunder? In its 105mm howitzer configuration, I would suggest foldering it with the 75mm variant at a better rating of 2.3 to 3.0. Though of course this is highly dependent on which shells it actually has access to. If it only has HE shells then obviously it will be around 2.3. If it has access to more then it will be at a higher battle rating. Potentially even higher than 3.0 if these shells are particularly effective. However the 75mm armed variant will likely be the more popular of the two variants. And this variant should go at a better rating of I would suggest about 2.3 to 2.7 maybe a little higher dependent on ammunition performance. But 2.3 to 2.7 would put it at about the same battle rating as the Marder Freeze in the German tech tree, and would allow it to plug the gap between the Sao 40 and M10 GMC in the French tech tree. Overall, I think this would be a pretty cool tank destroyer, and as Switzerland's first domestically designed armoured vehicle, I would love to see it given some love in War Thunder, while helping to beef up the French tech tree. Of course, as the NK-1 wasn't adopted, work was begun on its successor, the imaginatively named the Camp Canona 2. As you can see from the picture, it is a much better design and looks far more ready for the battlefield, having a rather distinctive fully enclosed fighting compartment. Indeed, the fighting compartment is one large cast, something of a technical achievement for Switzerland at the time, while also removing the need for the importation of RHA armour which Switzerland couldn't produce. The cast armour was also much thicker than on the previous NK-1, with a maximum frontal thickness of 70mm, a good amount of armour which is helped by the shape of the resultant cast, though I've not found any concrete figures for the rest of the tank. It also seems to have been fitted with the mantlet from the Jagdpanzer 38T, again bolstering protection around that area of the tank. Like with its predecessor, the NK-2 is armed with the 75mm length 49 Pack 44, which as mentioned when covering the NK-1, will likely give it a penetration in the region of about 120mm at 500m with APCBC shells, which is still a pretty good performance for a tank destroyer. Despite weighing in at over 24 tonnes, over double that of the NK-1, the NK2 is still capable of decent speeds thanks to its 300 horsepower V12 diesel engine, giving it a maximum speed of 50 km an hour or 31 miles per hour, allowing itself to quickly reposition should the need arise. One thing about the NK2 that surprised me was its size. 
as it looks to be quite big in the photos, but it is only actually 2.15 meters or a little over 7 foot tall, which when compared to the Axe Panther 38T's 1.84 meters or 6 foot, about 0.3 meter or 6 foot taller than the Yacht Panzer 38T. So this isn't a massive vehicle all things considered, which like I say kind of surprised me, and does allow it to conceal itself a bit better in ambush situations. Lastly, like with the NK1, the NK2 carries a crew of 5, consisting of a driver, commander, gunner and 2 loaders. Though again, some sources do say about there being 2 gunners and a loader, but in game it would definitely be 2 loaders. The NK2 was quite a good design for its time and would have been quite successful in service, with the actual design beginning around 1943-1944. However, by the time it was produced and in testing, it was 1946 and the war was over, so there was now less of a need for domestically produced tanks, or at least there was less time pressure to produce them. There were plans to produce more NK2 prototypes and test more weapons on it, including a 90mm gun. But ultimately, with the initial impetus for its creation gone, these plans were shelved for economic reasons, and only one prototype was created. Like its predecessor, it was sent to the Panzer Museum Tun, where it remains to this day on display. In War Thunder, the NK2 would definitely be one of the more interesting looking vehicles in game, where it would probably be at a better rating of 3.3 to 3.7, where its gun would still be very effective and its armour will make it a force to be reckoned with, especially if engaged from the front, forcing enemies to attack it at its more vulnerable flanks. Overall, I think this would be a rather fun tank destroyer, and it's definitely one of the Swiss tanks I'm most looking forward to. Of course, with the cancellation of the NK1 and NK2, Switzerland still needed some sort of armoured force, and in the end it went full circle and ended up buying tank destroyers from the newly liberated Czechoslovakia. Indeed this is likely what prompted the cancellation of the NK2 in the first place, as it was cheaper to buy an existing design from abroad instead of building a new one and all the related production facilities from scratch. Of course Czechoslovakia hadn't quite gone full communist at this point and was trying to rebuild its arms industry which due to war production still had a lot of unfinished holes and fully working factories that could still produce armoured vehicles. This leads us to the Panzer Jaeger G13. Now you've probably already asked the question, Terreno isn't this just a Jagd Panzer 38T? And technically you are correct, the Panzer Jaeger G13 was the Swiss designation for the STI, which was the Czech designation for the Jagd Panzer 38Ts that they built in the post-war era though there are some noticeable differences to the original design. For one, while the main gun is still 75mm, it is now the Stuck 40 rather than the Pack 39 as used by the German Jagdpanzer 38Ts. It is also fitted with a muzzle brake, helping to distinguish the original and post-war models. However, in-game both of these weapons have the exact same stats, meaning they would behave exactly the same, given an in-game penetration of 130mm at 500m with APCBC shells. As far as I'm aware, they did still retain the roof-mounted 7.92mm machine gun, which would help to bolster its firepower against unarmoured or aerial targets. In addition to the change in armament, many of the later G13s were fitted with the new Sauer 6-cylinder 150hp diesel engines, instead of the original Praga 6-cylinder 158-horsepower petrol engines. Despite the new engine, it still retained a top speed of 42km an hour or 26mph, though of course being a diesel there should in theory be a reduction in the risk of catching fire, though I'm unsure if this is actually represented in-game. I have also seen a few references to the loader and commander positions being swapped, which isn't a huge difference by any means, but this does mean that if a shell impacts from the right of the vehicle, it will be more likely to knock out the loader, thus reducing the combat effectiveness of the tank more than if the commander had been knocked out. Though the chances of a shell exploding within the vehicle and only knocking out one crew member does seem rather slim. Other than the aforementioned changes, the G13 is more or less the same as the Jagdpanzer 38T, having a maximum armour thickness of 60mm and a crew of 4, consisting of a driver, loader, gunner and commander. Ultimately, Switzerland brought 158 Panzerjäger G13s, 
and these would go on to serve until the 1970s, with many of these survivors being sold to private collections and museums, many of whom used them to represent German World War II era Jagdpanzer 38Ts. As for how it would play Warfunder, I suspect it would play almost exactly the same as the Jagdpanzer 38T already in game, so should be placed at a battle rating of 4.3, where it would have the same strengths and weaknesses as its predecessor. If placed in the French tech tree, this would again plug a gap, this time between the M10 GMC at 3.7 and the ARL44 at 5.3, allowing for better lineups in that nation's tech tree. Overall, while it is essentially just a Hetzer, it would be nice to see this vehicle represented in War Thunder, and would hopefully bolster the French tech tree, and it would be another nice Swiss vehicle to play in game. So, that's all of the Swiss tanks of World War II I would like to see added to War Thunder. There will be a part 2 covering Cold War and onwards Swiss vehicles, for which I've already started gathering sources. But I'd be interested to hear your views on these Swiss tanks, and whether there are any other vehicles you would like me to cover. I look forward to reading your comments below. Anyway, that's it for this episode on Swiss tanks. I hope you've enjoyed it and will join me for future episodes. I've been Terreno, and I'll see you next time.